Hey, everybody, you're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and today's show is a little bit different than usual. You see, Brewlosophy, both this podcast as well as the website, could not exist if it weren't for the fine folks who appreciate what we do enough to help us out a little bit. And we have a bunch of really simple ways to do so, one of which allows us to offer rewards to those who pledge a small monthly contribution. Patreon is a really neat platform that we've been using for the last couple of years. We have various pledge levels, each of which comes with its own set of rewards. Things like access to recipes we've never shared publicly, uh, unique discounts to Yakima Valley Hops. In fact, patrons this month received $6.99 off of each pound of 2018 whole cone hops they purchased pretty good deal if you ask me. And perhaps our most popular reward, which comes with a $3 monthly commitment, is an invite to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. So far, we've had some killer guests on uh, John Palmer, Michael Tonsmeyer, Scott Janish, Gordon Strong, and we've got some more killer guests coming up. Uh, Seth Klon from Mecca Great Estate Malt, Vinny Chalurzo from Russian River Brewing Company, and Dr. Charlie Bamforth from the UC Davis Brewing Program are all scheduled. Uh, Last month, the guest was Brewlosophy's most experienced brewer and highest ranked BG. JCP judge, my friend Malcolm Fraser, whose knowledge of brewing is very, very deep. Uh, I get quite a few emails asking about this particular reward, so I thought it'd be cool to share Malcolm's session with the rest of our listeners to give an idea of how they go. So that's what this episode is going to be all about. Now, an even less invasive way to support Brewlosophy involves using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when you do your online shopping. We get a little commission and you don't feel a thing. Uh, We also would really appreciate it if you left a rating and a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Uh, they take less than a minute to do. You can leave it while you're you know, listening to the show and uh, they make it very easy for those who may not know about us to find the show. Always a good thing. Uh, a couple of upcoming events in just a couple of weeks, Malcolm, Brian, and I are going to be in Yakima hanging out with our friends from Yakima Valley Hops during Hop Harvest. If you're around, let's hang out. Uh, we're going to be at the Fresh Hop Party on the night of Friday, September 28th, and then we're heading to the Fresh Hop Ale Festival the evening of Saturday, September 29th. Tickets for both of those events are on sale now. Get them early to save a few bucks. We are also going to be collaborating with Wandering Hop Brewing, who is brewing up a single hop beer for the Hop Chronicles. We'll be collecting data between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. on Saturday, September 29th, so come out and lend your palates to science. It is going to be a ton of fun. The beer was just brewed, and I'll tell you what, uh, I don't know if I've been so excited about a, uh, a single hop beer in a while. So uh, I can't say much more, but if you are in the Yakima area, head over to Wandering Up Hop on uh, Saturday and uh, September 29th, and we'll hang out and you get to participate in our weird brand of brewing science. Uh, in March of 2019, Denny Kahn and I are going to be leading a couple sem- seminars on experimentation and brewing for the Brew Your Own Boot Camp in Asheville, North Carolina this coming March. I've been hearing from a bunch of people who are already planning on going, so make Make sure if you want to go that you get your tickets now because they do go fast. All right, feedback. Uh, This week is brought to you by our friends from Imperial Yeast who provide brewers with the finest quality yeast on the market, packing 200 billion cells into each pitch right pouch. Brewers are ensured a quick and healthy fermentation with a wide range of ale and lager strains as well as some funkier stuff. Imperial Yeast is sure to have what you need to turn your wort into delicious beer. Go check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer at imperialyeast.com today. I'm sure you will be as satisfied as we have been. Okay, Jason Reed from Los Angeles, California. He wrote in to say, the episode on DMS was great and reminded me of a funny thing that happened a couple years ago. I made a really simple Bohemian Pilsner that I thought came out great. So did a bunch of my friends. However, when I gave it to one person who's also a high-ranked BJCP judge, they swore it had DMS. As hard as I dug, I could not detect DMS at all and neither could any of my friends, some of whom are also judges. When I suggested that maybe this guy's idea of DMS was wrong, he got pretty defensive, but everyone else pretty much agreed with me. We're all still friends, but this just made me think of what you were talking about, that some people think they're tasting one thing, even when it may not be there. Jason, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. I hear you. I've had the same experience multiple times uh, uh, with, with people thinking that they taste diacetyl or DMS or acetaldehyde. It is very interesting for sure, and I'm not really sure how to address the issue. I don't know what we can do to make uh, judges more, I guess, more accurate. Um, I, I know that some people are just so confident in their evaluation skills. I guess the only thing that I can see is improving it is, is one, just viewing the whole judge and beer evaluation thing as, as a fun thing, you know, um, doing it for fun. And, and I, to me, that makes sense. Um, but also I think, you know, as judges and as beer evaluators, we can try to intentionally be more equivocal, you know, describe the characteristics that we perceive rather than assigning some arguably unknown off flavor. 
That's all I got. Um, but I totally hear what you're saying, Jason, and I appreciate you uh, sending in the feedback. If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosphy.com or you can leave us a message by calling 951-444-0320. So we got a ton of great feedback on the recent Hard Cider episode that we did. And uh, you know, we definitely plan to do more with cider, including some interesting experiments and future episodes. Uh, well, I had a party at my place a couple months back and somebody brought over a sixer of this sort of cider-like beverage that ended up going Going untouched. I'd never had Red's Apple Ale before and was admittedly resistant to drinking these leftover bottles on my own, so instead I gave them to my buddies to review. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. No, the Lord is my shepherd. He knows what I want. Ooh, no, that's a cider. It's got like yeah. a little cherry smell. Yeah, it does smell delish, doesn't it? Here we go. I like this. Because you have no palate. Thank you. Now, would you like a learned man to weigh in? Tell me what you think. It is just a nice, clean, crisp cider. It's I mean, clean. It tastes like sparkling cider. I wouldn't drink it because I'm a big, hairy American man. It's not my favorite, but it, it's... Very tolerable. Oh, that's delicious. Yeah, I like that a lot. It's not bad. Let's show our appreciation for this fine beverage by putting it down immediately and with haste. It's gone. It's good. It's good and it's gone. It tastes like uh, Martin sparkling cider. No, it's delicious. It was, it was like a, I don't know. What do you think? Like an apple cider with some cherry hints, maybe? What is it? This is Red's Apple Ale. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's split hairs here. Apparently, I can't tell apple from cherry. We know what the F we're talking about, and he's trying to get in our heads. I didn't mind it at all. You actually seem like you fell in love with it, Tim. Now that you know what it is, you can go buy some and drink it. I think maybe I brought it over to his party a couple weeks ago. He just re-gifted us. I needed a way to get rid of these bottles. He just re-gifted us. I've never brought that over. Uh, so I'll tell you what, the, the Red's Apple Ale, I'd never tried this stuff in my life. I had uh, some pretty negative expectations of this thing, but I got to be honest, it was quite a bit better than I expected. Not that I'm going to go out and start buying six packs of Red's Apple Ale, but man, uh, definitely more cider-like than, than beer tasting. And I, I sort of expected it to taste like beer. It didn't. It was super clean, crisp, uh, very easy drinking. Now it's possible my experience was kind of influenced by like my expectation of terribleness, but honestly in a pinch, if there was no beer and, uh, this was all that was in the ice chest, I probably wouldn't turn it down in the future. Thanks to whoever left that in my ice chest a couple months ago. It wasn't Tim. I'm pretty certain it wasn't Tim. All right. If you have a beer or any other alcoholic beverage that you would like reviewed by my friends, Jersey and Tim, you can email me, marshall at brewlosophy.com, and we will get you all set up. When we come back, Malcolm's answers to patrons' questions. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Hi, I'm Stephen Leach, creator of Brow Supply Brewing Systems, here to tell you about our latest Unibrow Brewing System. Modeled after the brew-in-a-bag method, the Unibrow uses the same kettle for both mashing and boiling, replacing the fabric bag with a stainless basket that can hold up to 20 pounds of grain. A heating element is run by an electric controller that allows for the maintenance of specific mash temperatures and makes mashing easier than ever. Each Unibrow is shipped with a counterflow chiller and the parts required to brew a batch of beer. We're really proud of the Unibrow, and we know you'll love it as much as we do. Go check it out at BrowSupply.com and sign up for our email list to receive special deals in your inbox. 
Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code code BrewPod. That's B-R-U-P-O-D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. Peter says, I have two questions regarding temperature and timing. First question concerns yeast pitch temps for ales. My current process is to cool to groundwater temp. And during summer, I can only get to around 70s. This doesn't apply in cooler parts of the year where groundwater is cold. Got that aerate wart and within 10 degrees, then place a fermenter in temp chamber for fermentation. I've heard that this better to pitch at or slightly below fermentation temperature. I think that's, that is uh, common, commonly said, but I'm not sure we can tell, uh, you know, from fermentation temperatures wise. As far as our experiments go, I mean, you know, we, we ferment warm, so. Uh, I've heard that it's better to pitch slowly below and let it to warm up. Okay, sure. That's supposed to um, allow the yeast time to uh, wake up and then uh, the fermentation exothermic reaction will warm up the, the temperature of the, the wort now beer. So you can do that. Um, only takes a couple of hours to get the firm temp, get it. Should I aerate cool then pitch or cool aerate? in the fermentation chamber and then pitch. Skip the aeration completely, does it really matter? My beer is coming out delicious, but always looking to improve. Well, that last sentence there is kind of key. If it's coming out good already, uh, don't fix it if it, if it ain't broken. Um, what you could do is try it the other way, flip it around and see if it matters. You know, Try to do them side by side, see if it matters. But I, I just doubt you'd be able to tell unless it's an extreme case. Um, so what I do with my fermentation setup, I have a cooler and, um, well, not, well, I have both. I have a, I have a cooler, but I also have the SS Brewtech glycol system. So when I was in PA, my groundwater was pretty cool. So I was able to get my, even my loggers probably within 10 degrees. Then I could put it into my SS Brewtech uh, fermenters and get it cold with the glycol chiller, it only take like minutes. I mean, you can literally watch the temperature go down fairly quickly because uh, the glycol was, was yeah, 28 degrees. And then I would just pitch right away because it was only it was only warm for a matter of five minutes, 10 minutes max. Um, I did that because I could, but uh, if you're really worried about it, you could do an inline chiller. So you could do a bucket full of ice, you'd run another coil and you run your cold water through the first chiller first, that makes it even colder for when it goes to the chiller. So you're chilling your water before the water is chilling your wort uh, with ice and uh, a water ice slurry. You can even do salt water if you want. So if you're worried about it, you can try that and get to five, 10 degrees lower than your fermentation temp. And then, you know, see if that's better for you. To me, it's more hassle. If your beer's already coming out good, I would just do it the simple way, <laughs> personally. Uh, other question regards whirlpooling. I have always gone for the quickest cool down after flame out. Yes, I agree with that. Does stopping the process at 150, 170 to whirlpool affect the benefits of the cool down regarding protein haze? Thanks so much, Peter. Hey, Peter. Thanks a lot, man. Uh, so I also am an advocate of quickly chilling for a lot of reasons, obviously good protein coagulation, but also uh, uh, I want to minimize that time between you know the danger zone from when uh, things can get into my beer and potentially infect it, if you want to use that word, uh, contaminate it. Uh, for whirlpooling, I like, it depends what you want out of whirlpooling, right? If you're going for... Uh, if you're going for some bitterness, because some people want to pick up their bitterness there, they won't do any bitterness at the beginning, like at the 60 or 90 minute, if you're one of those crazy people. So if you want to do a 60 or 90 minute boil and add some bitterness there, go for it. Or you can do what a lot of people are doing, and as you alluded to, uh, keeping some haze in the beer. I think 
dry hopping at massive rates late seems to help improve stave uh, hay stability. It uh, could be anecdotal. Um, maybe it's some impact that the hop has on, on the boil versus doing it late. Uh, but it's, that I, I'm an advocate for that. But if you don't want bitterness, you want to keep cool, right? You want to be below 170. But if you want some bitterness, large, very large breweries, they're doing their whirlpools around 200 degrees, and they don't lose much temperature during that large uh, whirlpool because because of the thermal mass. So um, I've done some whirlpools in the pro setting where we have done a miniature whirlpool for a couple minutes, then diverted the water through uh, the chiller. You have to be careful to make sure the, the cone is set up real, real nicely. And then you pull off tangentially from the side, and it even works even better if you have a dam. And then you pull some of the wort through the chiller and put it back into the uh, whirlpool vessel to knock it down to like what home brewers do around 160, 170, or as you said, 150. Uh, that way, you're not getting bitterness from the whirlpool, you know. But that's not necessarily possible for for some breweries and some very large breweries. And I've also been witness. I've I've seen multiple breweries clog their chillers trying to do that if they don't do it well and don't have the process down uh uh hopefully that answered that question michael ferris says uh how did you get into home brewing uh, i've told the story before on the interwebs uh i was you know a beer fan in general just craft beer and uh and especially english beer because i thought i was supposed to being english um uh, English of birth. I'm, I'm American. I was raised here. Uh, so I used to go over to England and uh, help out at the pub that my aunt and uncle owned. And I would uh, just love these cask ales and would pop around when I was in England to drink these cask ales. So when I came home in the military, I, I was trying to find those and there wasn't very many examples. Well, one of my buddies, uh, someone I was roommating with, we had like four apartments, so two up top, two up, two in the bottom, when we were stationed in uh, Goose Creek, South Carolina. And he shouts down in his thick main accent, you know, Malcolm, we're making beer, come down here, you know, because he knew I liked to cook and liked beer. And I guess him and his father used to homebrew doing those kit and a kilo setups, which if you're not familiar with that, it's a, uh, it used to give you a little bit of extract and a kilo of, uh, of sugar, <laughs> which is 2.2 pounds. And then you'd ferment it with this rather gnarly looking yeast packet that looked like a, a lump of this whitish matter and it almost resembled Top Ramen, uh, the seasoning from Top Ramen. And then the hops were like grayish green, you know, and I don't remember what what, what type they were because at that time I didn't really know that much about, about the process. We made this beer, it was horrible. Uh, and being a sciencey type guy, you know, and loving... Uh, loving all aspects of, of doing research and, and looking into the process. And I treated it like a, like a challenge. I started reading a lot of books and there wasn't a lot of books to, to find back then, but, uh, started reading a lot of books and thought I could probably do better. So that was it. I was started the journey. I think my first book was the second copy of the joy of homebrewing. I don't think it was called the complete joy of homebrewing yet. I found it in some gnarly ratty local library in Charleston. Uh, and then I bought a book, brought it with me underway on submarines and read it probably 15 times, uh, cover to cover. That's it. That's how the journey started. And then right around that time, the internet was just kind of heating up to believe it or not, <laughs> you know, like a late nineties, early two thousands. And I started getting on the uh, forums, you know, reading people's experience there and hanging out at the local homebrew shop over in Hawaii. Uh, I actually met the guy who bought the homebrew shop that I used to hang out at, uh, when I went. We were in Minnesota. I saw this guy walking by with this uh, Hawaii homebrew, Hawaiian homebrew adventures shirt. I was like, hey, wait, is that, you know, we started talking and he had bought it from the, the previous owners. That was pretty cool. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Malcolm, do you do you do water additions just in the hot liquor tank or also in the other vessels? I've seen a lot of larger HLTs have sediment after the brew in the bottom, especially since not all salts dissolve readily. Uh, I don't put salts in the hot liquor tank, Jeremiah. Uh, I put them in the mash. And um, I've split them up before where I've done like half during the mash and then half again, or it's, it's actually, it's actually it's ratioed to the water. So it's like two thirds, one third, if you want to say it like that. 
uh, 60, 40, but, um, I put my, my minerals, my salts in the mash, give it a stir, let it, let it sit. And that's usually because of the impact on pH. And then when you start to sparge, you add the rest. Well, I batch sparge now, so I do all of them. Well, sometimes this is what I, this is what I like to do now. I put all my salts in during the mash. And if it negatively impacts pH, I use brewing water. If I see that it's negatively going to impact the pH, then I will back off on the salts uh, and then add most of them during the mash and then a little bit of a flick in, you know, during when I add the water for batch barge. But I like to simplify things and I'm always afraid that I might you know, forget to do it. So, you know, so usually I have my timer and all my, my stuff lined up on my brew table. So if I can, I add all my salts, you know, and I, I don't do a lot of salt additions other than uh, gypsum, you know, calcium sulfate and uh, calcium chloride. I don't do magnesium. I don't do baking soda. Uh, I just don't do all that stuff. I keep it really simple. It's either one or the other and sometimes both. Uh, we'll see how this water down here in Atlanta treats me. Um, in in uh, PA, I was very lucky to have moderately hard water. So here I, I've been told that our water is fairly soft. So hopefully I'm still able to brew some darker amber and dark beers without having to add baking soda. But you're right. If you just plop those into the hot liquor tank, unless you give it a long period of time, or if you're you know doing uh, you know changing the pH and doing it under pressure or something like that, you're just you're not going to get a lot of those salts dissolved directly into the hot liquor tank. I just don't see it, and you leave a lot of it behind. Uh, there's even people who advocate for adding the, the salts if you're doing it for purely taste and not for pH. You can add them, you know, after boil if you wanted to. Uh, you can add them in the bright tank or our version of a bright tank, you know, be a keg or, or whatever you do, you know, you can add it at the end of fermentation if you want to. It's worth experimenting and pe there's pro breweries who do it because you get much more bang for your buck instead of that, instead of those minerals being absorbed by the grain and then you throw them out, you can do it that way. Obviously, it's not going to affect the pH, so you're not going to get that aspect of the pH uh, impact. So it's, it's something you have to try and see if you want to do. You can certainly just add acid to the to the uh, mash and adjust your pH then, and then add your salts for flavor, you know, impact and mouthfeel. Obviously, with uh, sulfate purportedly adding dryness and crispness to the hoppy finish, and then uh, chloride providing a potentially more malty, smoother uh, mouthfeel. If you adhere to those beliefs, do it, try it. Talk back to us. Uh, have you ever played with a hop back? Is it worth the trouble? I have played with one. Um, I like them. I think it's neat. It's, it's cool if you want to play pro brewer. Uh, what I don't necessarily like about it is it's more stuff, you know, to clean, more stuff to hook up, uh, more places to leak, more volume loss. You know, uh, I. I do like the idea, especially if you get, I never got to the point where I was good with it. And I never got to the point where I was using it so consistently that I thought like, this is part of my process now, you know? Um, I, I like the idea of using a hot back as a Randall. I've done that for serving. So I had uh, use of the Blickman one. It wasn't mine. I was borrowing it, but we, we did that. We made a Randall out of it. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So I can't really say that I'm, I'm good enough or have enough experience to, to talk about the ins and outs and, and how to perfect it. You know, I, I know it's kind of futzy trying to get it to never leak and, and, uh, and all that. I, I think there's probably someone better to, to give their advice on it. I've used hotbacks on the pro side. That's completely different, but it's all set up and it's part of the process. Is it worth buying an RO system? Does it make it that much? Does it make that much of a difference in the water? Well, it'll if it's functioning, it'll make a huge difference because RO will your hardness level and your well your ion level will go from depending on the efficiency of the of the RO system, it'll go from say your TDS is like 150, 200, it should bring it to you know almost zero. So you have almost nothing in that water, hence. Uh, RO and, and DI water being considered more or less acidic because it 
it doesn't have any buffer in it, uh, and it can be highly corrosive. And it also has no minerals to benefit the yeast. It has no minerals to benefit the mash and, and alter pH. It has no buffering capacity, you know. So it's a blank template, and I like them. I've brewed, a lot of my friends have had them back home because our, our water can be kind of quirky in, in PA. Not where I was. I had great water. <clears throat> but the water can be quite hard, and it can be, uh, you know, all over the place mineral-wise. So there was a lot of people who had them, and we would just build our water up in the mash, you know, using brewing water, make a calculation and adjust from there. I am not going to put one in here in, uh, in Georgia unless the water is really troublesome. Uh, but I was told it's more or less soft already. So I'll probably just use a carbon filter and strip out the aromatics and organics and the things that make the, the water taste funny and have the potential impact of adding chlorophenols. So that can be done with carbon filter. Uh, if I had troublesome water, Tom, I would look into an RO system because you know you have to do the cost benefit analysis for you. Is it worth going to the store if you have bad water and buying, you know, five gallon jugs of RO? Then if it's not that big of a deal, if you don't brew too much, then don't buy an RO system. If you have trouble with your pipes and you're worried about your washing machine and your dishwasher, if you're constantly cleaning scale off of your shower heads, etc., then maybe it's worth it. Maybe you know, because you can buy them fairly affordable now. And if you're handy, you can install them yourself at, at a certain location. You can do them under your sink or you can do a whole house one right at the, the intake at the wall. So, you know, I, my buddy Chris uh, Bernetti back home, he had one and he had it with a float. So it would just, he had to set it and divert it instead of going to the house. It would go to this massive tank. It, it looked like a giant water softener tank and it had a ball float. So when it fil- filled up, it would shut itself off. And uh, it had obviously a tank underneath it in case you had to overflow, <laughs> you know, come home to a big mess. But uh, he had to start it like the day before, so it took some planning. But he would collect, you know, enough enough water to do a twenty gallon batch because he had a big uh, uh, more beer system, one of the one of the first more beer systems, the horizontals. So it was great, you know. You get into some futzing with hard hardness so if you're trying to brew a very dark beer. Obviously, it seems. Uh, it's not exactly one for one when you're doing uh, lime or baking soda, trying to trying to adjust for some buffering so that your pH doesn't go real real low during the mash for very dark beers to counteract the uh, the natural acids, organic acids from the dark malt that exist. So if we didn't add, he was using baking soda when I first showed up. I think we switched over to lime, pickling lime, because uh, doesn't add the sodium and it seemed to be more. Uh, you got more bang for your buck. It was more uh, impactful. So there's some challenges with RO there, of course. You know, the added expense, some maintenance. You you waste a lot of water. There's a lot of reject water on, on most RO systems. And it, it depends on the system, but it could be as much as 2 to 3 to 1. So for every gallon you make, the reject water will be almost 3 gallons. So it can be pretty troublesome in areas with high water bills. So you have to consider that, too. Uh, any process tips for newer brewers, particularly around cleaning kegging? When do you, this is a gym, sorry. When do you clean a kicked keg? How do you store an empty keg? Do you leave kegs full of sanitizer? I'd like to get more efficient at kegging process in general, so I'm curious if you have any tips. A uh, number one tip I would do is clean your keg right away. As soon as you kick it, at least rinse it. It'll get rid of the hard scale, so when it comes time to cleaning it, it's easier. So if you can do that, that's pretty helpful. Now, have I always done that? No, I've I've kicked a keg and said I'll get it later, and then later becomes weeks. Um, the the powder brew wash for me, a hot soak and, and powder brew wash, are, are other brands similar to it, works miracles. I mean, I've had very little trouble getting stuff off with a long soak. And then if you have to, I've used the non-abrasive scrubby pads and those magic erasers work real well too to get some of that grime off and it's a keg stainless you know so it's going to take some abuse just don't gouge it uh when do you clean a kick keg so that i got that I, I rinse it i try to clean it right away if i can but if you don't it's not the end of the world um i've had good success with oxyclean especially if i think i'm gonna have to soak this thing one or two times you know you don't mind doubling up uh you can use oxyclean you know i don't think it works quite as well in my experience with the very very aggressive and hard to get rid of 
build up deposits, and, and that's because of the makeup of uh, of PBW. You know, it has it's designed to work with brewing equipment and those organics. Uh, it has a chelator in it. It has uh, has chemicals to take away the hardness, breaks up the bond from the hardness of the uh, sediment or the residue on the keg, and it breaks the bond with the metal, which I don't think OxyClean has, because uh, by what it, it's, it's, it's made to work in laundry. Um, so it works really well with, you know, typical soiling agents, but not so much um, metal, you know, the metal ions that are in beer. Uh, I'd like to get more efficient at kegging process in general, so I'm curious if you have any tips. Kegging process, uh, I store my kegs, so I, I clean them, and I store them with sanitizer, and before I keg, I fill my, this is this is a bit higher level, but I fill my kegs with, uh, I do the math and try to get around 8 to 10 ppm of uh, sodium bicarbonate. Now it's, uh, pardon me, uh, sodium metabisulfate. And I do that to oxygen scavenge. And then I push that uh, K-meta or, you know, sodium-based uh, metabifos- metabisulfate up and out with with co2 so now i have a supposedly clean and inert keg and i know that pushing it with co2 is going to add some uh oxygen because you know co2 is co2 but hopefully and it seems to have worked i you know <clears throat> anecdotally and, and through some testing with my my do meter is hopefully i have you know almost no or are lower than i would have had otherwise oxygen levels in that keg and then i I'm using the the Brutech Chronicles, uh, so I push those out with CO2 into my now inert keg. I go into the liquid line, and on my outline, I have a spunding valve. So I set that to, you know, one or two pounds, three pounds, and I push with just half pound over that. I've done it gravity too, you know, without the spunding valve. That seems to work if you're if you're not at that level yet. Um, I think you can look at Marshall's setup, and he had he does racking canes into a keg i think he's going into the liquid out so i think he you know fills them with co2 first and then just lets them uh has the vent open so that's you know a decent way to to keg and minimizing you're at least minimizing oxygen there jeremiah says cool thanks man you know it jeremiah nice hanging out with you at a homebrew con man always like seeing you and tell your friend i said hello too I like the idea of just ignoring hot side and just doing pH by acidulated. Try it. Give it a rip. Let me know. Uh, then adding water. Check it out, man. You can you can do it on in a glass, too. Uh, just right right there, pour a beer. Mix up a little slurry of, uh, of calcium chloride and calcium sulfate and add it right to, the, right to the beer as you're drinking it. Do you do water adjustments based on final volume or initial volume of water? Um, I adjust the water as if it was going to have the profile that it would have had or as it would have been desired to have. So I mentioned earlier, often you do, you know, 60, 70%, whatever it is of your mineral additions to the mash water. So your strike water, but I add those minerals to the mash. So what you're doing there in brewing water is you're adding say calcium sulfate to get a calcium sulfate level of we'll just say 150 so it knows you have six gallons or five we'll just use five gallons because it's easy five gallons 19 liters and then you have to add so many grams to that water to make it appear as if it had 150 ppm of uh sulfate and probably somewhere around a third of that of so probably about 50 ppm not quite 50 but about 50 ppm calcium because of the volume you had and the number of grams you added of uh, calcium sulfate on my calcium sulfate containers uh, there's a couple pictures of some of my earlier experiments where you can see right on the can or the jar i have written how many how many ppm per gram i i add just so i can do a quick you know adjustment in my head uh so you've treated the water as if it would have had, say, 50-ish ppm calcium and 150 or so ppm of sulfate. You're not all going to get that into the 
into the beer because it's going to be held up. I mean, it's going to be held up in the grain. It's going to react. You know, the calcium is going to re- react with the phosphate, which gives us that fight and reaction, which lowers pH. Uh, some of the calcium is going to be used up by the yeast, uh, and, and some of those minerals are going to be held up in the grain in general. So it's not an exact science. And the amount we put in, we kind of know, oh, well, I put in this many grams for, for my five gallons, and this is how my beer tasted. So now I've made notes, and I can go back next time and say, well, I want to add a little bit more than that because I want it to be more aggressively, you know, more aggressive with sulfate hardness. I want more sulfate impact on my palate. If you wanted to do the calculation, as I told Jeremiah, you wanted to do your acid addition in the mash and then add that amount of, uh, or add some specific amount of calcium sulfate into the beer, so now you're adding it in the keg, for example, you might need to dial that back because you'll find out you get much more bang for your buck in the bright and much more bang for your buck in the serving vessel, which is exactly why some larger breweries have practiced this. You know, Not all of them do. Most of them like the simplicity of the mash and mo- of adding in the mash, and most of them like that because it's, uh, you know, you're know, you doing it at the time of the mash, so it also impacts your, your pH. And it's a widely practiced method. So, you, you know, when you talk to other people, they're talking similar language. Like, you know, how much are you adding here? How much are you adding there? Uh, I know a few breweries who are adding in the brights are in the serving vessel. It's not as common as, as the mash, though. Can you tell us about your BJCP history, Marshall? That sounds, that sounds personal. Uh, my history, um, I've been... I started brewing in 98. I didn't start brewing for competition until I met up with the trash guys. And there was a whole bunch of us at once who showed up. And we were all newer brewers. And we were kind of reading the uh, Brewing Classic Styles at the time because it was a great book. One of, the, one of the things I found out early on was a lot of the books had these recipes, but they weren't necessarily tried and true, meaning they weren't, uh, they weren't vetted in any way. So I, what I liked about Jamil and John's book was that all the recipes were written in a standard format by the same people, and they had won at least something, you know, by, by supposedly our hopefully unbiased judges. So that premise was attractive to me. So now I could brew all these recipes and say, well, if I brew this recipe properly, it should at least be a good beer. I've brewed many recipes from magazines and from books prior to how to brew or uh, prior to brewing classic styles, and the beer would come out bad, often not not always. So I had to say to myself, is this because I'm a beginner brewer, or is this because the recipe is bad? And it could have been a little bit of both. So it was nice to have a template where it was like, if you do these things, this beer should be good. If the beer is not good, it's probably you, meaning the brewer. I liked that. That was very attractive to me. All of us people from trash showed up and we were all kind of doing this, you know. So when we ended our competition, it was truly a brewer competition. Two or three of my friends might have also brewed that recipe. Now that became a a great issue of uh, camaraderie, right? We were all competitive, but in a friendly, supportive way. So I quickly realized I'm having I'm brewing these book these recipes based on this book based on BJCP styles. So what's this BJCP thing? And I'm entering these beers and getting judged, but I'm not really aware of the process. You know, so I thought, well, if I'm gonna be subject to it, I should be part of it. So I started judging at competitions. And uh we are lucky enough to have a pretty good base group of, of brewers who were all competing at the same time and we all kind of came up through the ranks together, so we all decided to study together and we all passed you know almost at the same rate going up through the ranks and we were getting experience points and then and taking the tests uh gordon strong happens to live by us so he was good friends with someone in our club named keith cost who was at this time i think a master or he he might have been national when i met him but he quickly became a master judge and uh so he was a great mentor to our group as well uh, along with gordon you know and we have some other great judges in the area uh, in Ohio and Indianapolis this this wonderful group who were supportive with us and would come down and they would proctor our exams and they would help us study it was an, a great community and 
you know, it was almost two different groups. You had like your 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 local home brewing group, but you also had like this wider group of judges. You know, and we all see each other at these competitions. It was it was just awesome. Uh, I, I just feel very lucky to have been part of that. Sandy Cockerham, uh, Agatha Feltis, Gail Milborn, uh, Greg Brooks. Uh, I mean, just I could just go on and on about all the people in that area, and that it was just really cool and i'm still friends with these people i I would go to these competitions and stay at their houses and stuff and um at one point gordon wanted he thought that the you know bgcp was getting big enough where not only do they have regional reps but they have assistants so he asked me if i would be his assistant and i felt you know that was pretty nice thing for him to ask and him to have confidence in me to do that so i did that for a couple years i was the mid-atlantic bjcp rep our assistant at least and uh now that i'm here in georgia there's a gentleman called phil farrell he is the southeast uh bjcp rep so i'm i've reached out reached out to him i've met him at competitions and stuff like that and we'll see if i can help him out as well so uh i guess that's my history started judging 2004 ish rose up through the ranks while judging at competitions more from malcolm as soon as we return from this short break When dumping wort-soaked grain in leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods, allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12-pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and cleanup is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the in addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to Grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to Grainfather.com. That's Grainfather.com and get started today. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the super fast counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. Shopping for brewing supplies online can be a real hassle, which is why we recommend Love to Brew. They've got great prices, super fast shipping, and they carry exclusive products like East Coast Yeast, the Brewers Essentials brand, and their award-winning beer recipe kits. They're also the only place you can pick up your very own Brewlosophy recipe kit. The numbers don't lie. Love to Brew has hundreds of five-star reviews and thousands of brewers are choosing them for their supplies and ingredients each year. Experience the difference at lovetobrew.com. That's love, the number two, brew.com. Favorite brewery in Pittsburgh? No such thing, Tom. Uh, Right when I left was a hard time to leave. A lot of my friends had opened breweries. Uh, 
So, you know, to sit there and say one is better than the other, it, it, that to me is kind of a fool's errand. I have a, a very big soft spot for Roundabout because Steve Sloan and Diane are amazing, awesome people, very supportive of the homebrew community. He's a very talented brewer, Steve. Most people in the area, if you ask them who the best and most knowledgeable brewer is, uh, a lot of people point to him. I mean, there's other guys and gals who are good at certain things, but all around knowledge-wise and experience and what he gives back to the area, Tom, uh, Steve Sloan is pretty amazing. Uh, and his beers are great because he is that, as I said. Uh, I really like Hitchhiker. That's my friend Andy Kwiatkowski. I love uh, Dancing Gnome. Um, Andrew Witchy, very talented, hazy, pale ale brewer. Helicon is my friend Andy Weigel, so I love Helicon for their lagers. Uh, Penn Brewery is an old staple. I mean, I could just go on and on. There's so many. Um, there's some guys doing some some cool things now, like Cinderlands. Uh, he's a brewer. He's an import, I think, from Michigan. Uh, it might be Chicago, I forget. But I mean, it's Paul Schneider. He's awesome, too. He's doing some very innovative creations that are like saison and pale ale based and he's not afraid to you know mess around with flavor beers that i probably normally wouldn't have, have, have wanted like a like a green tea kolsch or something like that but he is very good at flavor combinations and you know you, you might look at it on, on the menu and go hmm not my thing and then you taste it and you're like wait this guy knows what he's doing he's he's blending with some grace you know instead of just making it pound over your head with some flavor making it like uh all these milkshake beers which are cool but I, I don't want that. You know, I don't want my beer to taste like a daiquiri. Uh, I can enjoy them, have a sip or two, and go, neat, cool, way to go, dude. Uh, but mostly I want my beer to taste like beer, then beer, and then beer, and then some nuanced flick that you've experimented with and shown to have some artistic grace. Uh, you've mentioned before that you perform a decoction. This is from Matt Del Fiaco. I think I've heard of him. On some of your beers, can you talk more about when you think a decoction is appropriate? Uh, decoctions are for Tuesdays. Um, everyone knows that. You should always decoct on a Tuesday. If you're brewing on a Wednesday, that's a single mash, single infusion. Uh, Thursdays are for brewing a bag and so on. Um, I don't think a decoction's necessarily needed. It's something you do if you want to do it. It's part of the fun for you. It's part of the process. You're attaching yourself to a history and style you know, such as a Czech lager and, and many German beers. Uh, we did an experiment where we showed that people couldn't tell. And that might be my fault. Maybe I didn't do the decoction justice. I think I did. I know I brewed with all my heart because I like decoction and I like, like history. So I tried to do a heavy decoction, and I, I think I did a triple decoction. Um, I want to do that experiment again when I get set up here in Georgia. So not only was that experiment not significant and you know as far as the result goes when it was blinded but then i told people and some of those people were the exact same people that marshall asked me about the, the bjcp history a lot of the people in the room were very good judges you know to my experience and to my opinion and i told them one of these beers is decocted one of them's not you tell me which and they couldn't tell they were just amazed yeah just they we couldn't believe it and uh so, you know, like I said, I'm going to try it some more. I'm going to, I'm going to try to do some Czech lagers because I love Pilsner or Kell. Um, I'll be talking to some people who are known to be good at that, you know, Andy Johnson in particular. But uh, I have some contacts at, at Pilsner or Kell now, uh, luckily. And, you know, I'll be talking to them and, and trying to emulate a Czech lager as best I can. And I'll do it with and without a triple decoction or whatever methods they suggest. And... You know, we'll see if we can coax out a difference. <laughs> uh, I do like, I do like the aspect of the history appeal, and I do know in Pilsner or Keld beers, not having had that beer, of course, made in a non-decoction way, but it does seem to have this this crusty uh, baguette character to it. You know, uh, the combination of the diacetyl, uh, residual diacetyl, which is you know small amounts. And that, you know, burnished gold malt character that I think is picked up from the decoction, to me, it's almost like a, a well-baked, crusty baguette. I love it. It's heaven. Uh, and I want that in my beer, you know. So I think that's decoction. I'm sure an element of it is the 
is the floor malted, uh, their their custom malted, you know, grain. Their uh, Mor- Morovian, uh, Bohemian Pilsner malt, whatever it is. So that probably has an aspect to it too, but. I, I want to find out if that if that's the case. I, I can't imagine they're doing it if they could emulate it without doing it, unless it's just purely a sense of tradition and history. Eric says thanks. Sometimes I get high boil off rates, hence the question. Never thought of adding mineral additions later. Cool idea. Love brewing classic styles too. Right on, Eric. Stay groovy. Jim, thanks, Malcolm. So it sounds like you tend to store empty kegs full of sanitizer. Yeah, usually. I'm not not always, but if I if I'm gonna use them in quick order, I do. Uh, uh, that's typically my my method. Or or the potassium metabi sulfite solution. Do you ever bother drying kegs? So I I if I store them with liquid in it, it's sanitizer. You know. I wouldn't want to do that. I don't think I'd want to do that for a super long time because that sanitizer can start to break down mm-hmm. and then it becomes kind of slimy on the walls and uh, then it's kind of hard to rinse and stuff. So I like to be able to use it. Uh, if I store it with sanitizer, I usually plan on using it within a, a couple of weeks, you know, I hope. Um, if I Do I dry kegs? If I dry it, I just take the lid off and put it upside down. After it's dry, I put the lid back on and I, I store it full of CO2 so it's pressurized. So, you know, most of my kegs are, are full. <laughs> and if I have empty ones, there's like five or six of them, you know. Uh, so I, I guess I don't really do long-term storage of dry kegs. Marshall says, Helicon, hell yeah, man. Uh, Michael Ferris, can you explain in detail, ooh, in detail, with or without drawings, how you maintain such a gorgeous beard? And that's that's a wonderful question. I think it's the high fat diet uh, and bacon. So if I were to guess, I love bacon. I love fatty things. I love chicken wings. I'm pretty sure that's it. I'm pretty sure. And then my wife recently got me a a, a badass beard kit. I should have I should have it so I could do like a product uh, product placement. Beard oil and, and and brush it, man. I mean, it's not easy. Peter. McMindy's. I found chlorine was getting through my carbon filter, bastard. To the point I had to dump beer with phenolic off flavors. Yep, yep. I you know funny enough is you'll you'll see that in some of these newer breweries that start up you know after doing two batches and their friends told them they should open a brewery, which is a lot of them, and uh, they'll have chlorophenols in their beer and they just understand it. It's weird. Most beginning brewers should know that, but uh. Da da da. Switch to RO and never had a problem. You're right. You're comfortable with Atlanta water and carbon filtration. I'm not comfortable with Atlanta water at all because I've been here 58 days, so uh, we're still we're still getting to know each other. But yes, my water is, is chlor uh, chlorine full, uh, full of chlorine, chlorine. So on my uh, my tap under my under my kitchen sink, I have a carbon filter, inline carbon filter, and in my refrigerator I have a carbon filter I will definitely be running my water through a larger high volume carbon filter when I set up my brew my brew setup do you have a really slow filter so that's that's the key you know um, more contact time more surface area and a combination of the two improves improves the ability to remove chlorine so most chlorine most high quality chlorine filters now are like little tiny itty bitty pellets so they're designed to allow you to pour at like 1.5 um oh wait it's like 1.5 gallons a minute or something like that so i was testing mine out and it was it took like 11 seconds to to fill and i think it was 10 ounces so i i had these 10 ounce glass i use all the time and it took 11 seconds to fill it so whatever that flow rate is someone do the math for me but it's slow it's really slow in my under my sink one, it's a much larger filter, so it moves a little faster. But I do, I do pick up a hint of chlorine still in that. So that's why I think when I do my brew system, I'm gonna have to go to one of those uh, like three vessel. They, they often call them big blue. You can get them on Amazon or whatever. They're, they're these large cartridges. Uh, here's my yeah, Ooh, this way. They're like they're huge. They're like a you know. Uh, they're probably about as big as your torso, and you use three of them. I think the first one can be like a larger, uh, 
larger grain or bead and then it has like some sediment filter and then you keep going down and then the last one's like this super super fine powder of, of uh carbon so i'll probably go to one of those i had one of those in pa because the water was was pretty uh pretty full of chlorine and chloramine there so even though i would put it through a chlor uh, a carbon filter i would still often you know put a, a tab of uh a Camden tab for for insurance to make sure I got rid of the chloramine because chloramine much more stable. You can remove some of it with a carbon filter if you go nice and slow, but uh, it's it's pretty stable. That's why they put it in there. That's why I switched over to it. It's not as red not red as readily off gassing. It doesn't uh, adhere to carbon as well. So that's the whole purpose of it. So it maintains its killing power power through the transit process from the municipality to our, our end use. Um, so yeah, that's what I'll be doing. I don't trust our municipalities to stay consistent. No, they, they don't. And in fact, occasionally they, they crank up the, the level of chlorine and chloramine. Uh, they do the, these, these bursts occasionally to make sure they do like a, a mass kill or if they have a increase in biologics. So, you know, if you have a, a big rainstorm and you have a lot of runoff and, and they might, they might goose the system up with a higher dose, you know, double dose of Fokker. So you have to, you know, use a slow moving filter, a large media bed. That's why I like those big blues, you know, and a little bit of, a little bit of uh, Camden tablets would, would help too. If you ever get that. What was your most colossal brewing failure? Oh, geez. Uh, there's just so many. <laughs> um, I made a Hefeweizen that, you know, I, I used to be able to turn Hefeweizens. I used to brew them all the time. And I could probably turn them in 9 to 14 days, no problem. I think I turned one in like 10, 11 days for a competition. But, you know, there's something to say for time. I like fast brewing, but I didn't give it enough time to mature. And... I kegged it up and I was hoping the kegging process, you know, with the, with the auction. So I didn't do a closed transfer or anything. I, I kind of did a sloppy transfer trying to get rid of some of the sulfur. But in the keg, as soon as you poured it, it smelled like lit match and rotten eggs. And my, my friend Jack Smith, he seems to be kind of sensitive to sulfur in general. But he was give, he's, to this day, he gives me no end of shit for that egg beer. I mean, it was, it was atrocious. It, it smelled like bad cheese. It had so much sulfur in it. Uh, you know, I've had an, I've had enough failures where I've had, you name it. I, I tried to do a, even before the New England haze craze, uh, I tried to do a keg only competition in in Cincinnati beer and sweat, and I dry hopped in the keg, uh, and I, I don't know how I did it because it was years ago, but by the time I got to the competition, which is only like a four hour drive, it just tasted like pure grass. So. The other one smelled like eggs and sulfur. This one smelled like someone had mowed the lawn and dumped it in my keg. Uh, I thought it had no chance. You know, I entered it anyway because I already paid for the entry. I, I'm pretty sure it, it either took third or scored high. I don't remember, but it's, it actually did fairly well. I think it might have been right around when the the, uh, the fresh hot beers were, were getting popular. So some, I think someone probably thought, well, this is a fresh hot beer. And I thought it tasted like lawn clippings. <laughs> joining brew lots of me. hell yeah uh, that, that's been a good thing for me man you know i'm meeting so many great people um i've become very good friends with brewlosophy the, the the crew i mean i i look forward to events such as the uh, the yakima uh fresh hop festival you know going to be able to hang out with marshall and uh and brian and all the guys from yakima and uh, i think the mecca guys are going to be there marshall give me a give me a thumbs up or whatever there but yeah i mean there's always drama as, as soon as you start becoming, you know, somewhat popular, which we are thanks to you guys. Uh, there's always haters, but you know, if you never have any haters, that means you're not doing anything right. You're not having an opinion. So I, I welcome both. I like the interaction, uh, from Brewlosophy as far as, uh, meeting people, you know, at, at these events and, and we just try to keep it real, just being good people, you know? Are you into brewing sour beers at all? From Scott Mendez. Uh, yeah, it's probably my favorite. I, well, maybe Pilsners are my favorite. I, I love sour beers. So uh, when I moved here to Georgia, I had a a problem in which I had to decide which kegs I could bring. You know, I didn't want to pour all my beer out. 
but I couldn't bring, I, did, I didn't have a, a van at the time. We, we are now the proud owners of a, of a minivan. But all I had was my, my dad car, my Toyota Camry. So I thought like, well, I could probably get three or four behind each seat. I could put a couple, you know, in the back seat, maybe one or two in the front. And then I should probably bring some of my clothes down too. I was moving down a week or two before my wife and kids. So I'm sitting there. If you've ever seen the movie, uh, The Good Son, there's a scene. Go watch the movie if you haven't seen it. Oh, wait. All right. So uh, there's a scene in which the mother is, has to, this, this spoiler alert, has to decide which which kid she's going to drop off this cliff. You know, she's holding on to both kids. So uh, that's how I was like with these beers. You know, I'm sitting here like, oh, my God, you know, tasting this one. I'm like, oh, this one's better. Uh, uh, this one, not so much. So there you go. Well, the, the mover, the truck driver comes down. He goes, what are you doing? And, and why are you why are you crying over beer? And I told him the situation. I said, well, you guys won't move beer. It's full of liquid. And, you know, it's going into storage for a couple of days. And he goes, yeah, but when are you going to be down in Georgia? And I told him, like, you know, probably Monday. And he goes, well, I'm going down there this weekend. And the storage place doesn't open until Monday morning. So if you show up Sunday or first thing Monday morning, I will move your kegs for you. So it was too late for that one keg that I had dumped, but I decided I'm bringing, uh, I was like, how many kegs will you, will you bring? And he's like, uh, I don't know. I have a massive truck here. So I brought 14 kegs full of sour beer from PA to Georgia in the back of a moving truck uh, and, and a couple of carboys too of some long going cultures and uh, probably five or six barrel aged, you know, stouts and such. But, uh, that's how much I love sour beers. I moved 14 kegs of sour beer from from PA to Georgia, thanks to this friendly mover guy. Any love for kettle sour beers? Um, yeah, I, I brew. I used to brew a lot of Goza and a lot of Berliner Weiss. And in fact, probably four or five years ago, that was one of the things I was, uh, I want to say known for, that's a bit lame, but it's one of the things that I was doing a lot in our area before they became as popular as they are now. And because of that, it was one of my ins. You know, water was certainly an in, water treatment, but doing kettle sours was one of my ins to some of the local breweries because they would ask me my process and they would ask me my salt and coriander ratios for uh, Goza. Um, so, you know, I, have, I do have a, a large affection for those. And I was lucky enough to do some tech editing for a couple magazine articles and then for uh, John Palmer's How to Brew, the latest edition, you know, I was talking about kettle sours one day when we, when we were hanging out and he said, would you share your notes? And I was like, he, oh yeah. I mean, cause he shared with me a massive book. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I don't know how much exactly went of my stuff. Cause he, I actually redirected him to Milk the Funk and Matt Humbard and, uh, uh, I think the guys from uh, Speciation. So I, I, I told him about them and said, hey, this is where a lot of my experience in sharing comes from. So go find these guys. And he was cool enough to like reference them in his book. So that was pretty awesome of him. Uh, the Sour Beer blog, I think he referenced them as well. I brewed a uh, Goza with Fatheads as a GABF beer, I think two or three years ago. So yeah, a lot of love with, with uh, Goza and Berliner. I like making straight Berliners. And then I like making uh, fruited versions of it. So pineapple is one of my favorite. Um, I like making gozas straight up and then uh, mixing them with liqueurs. So I like goza with tequila. And I also like doing uh, slightly tart versions of original style. So like grisette and saison, you know, do a sour mash or a sour kettle portion. <coughs> Pardon me, like one or two gallons. And then mixing it, blending it into a, a beer that is a grisette or Saison, and then you're just tweaking the sourness a little bit, so there's like a little tart edge to it. Uh, oh, another thing that's awesome is Meyer Lemon. Meyer Lemon Berliner Weiss is, is amazing because you get a little bit of lemon character, but also some orange character. Uh, I put a little bit of Meyer Lemon juice towards the end of fermentation, and then I put some zest in uh, at flame out, just like you're doing a, a wit beer, really. Marshall is texting with Seth... Now he's going to try to make it. That's awesome. Seth is a great dude. Mecca Estate Malts. Um, cool people. Very cool people. Eric Pierce. Thinking of trying to work out a wild Concord grape sour in the Berliner Weiss goes a kettle sour vein. All right. Any ideas about this? 
too much tart, crazy idea. Well, nothing's crazy. Uh, try it, you know. Um, Concord grapes have a very specific grape character. <clears throat> and in fact, the artificial grape flavor candy that we is ubiquitous for like Jolly Ranchers and, you know, all those types of lollipops is based off the, the flavor or one of the main components of Concord grapes, which is why a lot of people in Europe, when they have grape flavored American stuff, it doesn't taste like grapes to them because they're thinking of different grapes. Uh, Concord grapes are very, very prevalent and and uh, popular in the U.S., especially because of you know Welch's grape jelly. So some people outside of the U.S. don't get the the grape flavor thing. I think the grape flavor from Concord grapes is a bit much. That's just me. Maybe it's because I associate it with artificial grapes. Uh, I think a Berliner with wine grapes would be amazing, especially like a uh, Sauvignon Blanc, you know, slightly tart Sauvignon Blanc uh, grape. But if you have access to Concord grapes and you like that sour grape, I mean, that's a candy, right? That's popular. Try it once. Try it twice, you know. How would I do it? Um, I would probably, hmm, depends what you want from it. I bet if you did on the must, you might take over some wild yeast and some natural lacto and, and such. So that'd be kind of cool to to ferment a Berliner or Goza on the on grape must. And you pick up color too, and you you get the sugars for sure and the flavors. You could uh, separate the must and just use the juice, you know. And I think both will give you different characters. You'll get more color from contact with the skins, of course, just like uh, when you do wine. So you know this is where the art comes in. This is what this is the cool part of doing these funky types of beers. Is you know what did you do? And then you would start talking to people who have done things like this. You know, they have beers that are a mix of uh, a wine and beer, you know. So are you, gonna, you can add just the juice to the fermentation. You can do it on the must and pick up the color and the flavor there. You can bring the must over without cleaning it up, without using uh, sorbate or uh, metabisulfate like you would on a standard wine. So you could leave the uh, wild yeast and whatever microbes are on there and get the character that way. It'll be a bit unreliable, but it could be a cool experiment. If you want to go more controlled, you could just add juice to the fermenter. Uh, you could add juice during packaging. You know, all those all those fruit super sweet beers are popular now. Uh, I mean, the, the way to experiment is endless. You know, I would probably my first time I'd probably ferment it on the grapes because it's more wild and more crazy, and you get the color. And then I would probably adjust the flavor with some juice in the fermenter because I, I don't I wouldn't want it sweet personally. And then if I thought it was too sour and too sweet, then I'd probably uh, adjust, I'd back sweeten in the keg. Uh, as far as souring it goes, hmm, I'd probably do a traditional, I'd probably do a traditional sour, a Berliner. So I'd kettle sour, and then when it came time for fermentation, I would add the must with the juice. That's how, I think I, that's how I would do it. And then if it came up messed up, go back to the drawing board, try again. What do you think is one of the biggest challenges facing newer breweries today? Uh, being good. Uh, so unlike five, six years ago, when local had its own flavor, and it still does, uh, five, six years ago, I think you can make a meh beer and get away with it longer than you can now. So, you know, last year we grew, I think it was like 18%, 19% as far as number of breweries, but the volume increase in the industry was only around 5%. So that means that means uh, a lot more people making less beer. So not less by total volume because volume did go up, but you had a five percent share increase in volume throughout craft, but a twenty percent increase in number of breweries. So that means you have to you have to change your the way you want to be successful. I think the the victory and the trogues and the Sierra Nevadas of the world for a little while are going to be on the out. You know, I think you. You have to say small and, and super local and rely on traffic over your 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 tap room. You make five to seven times more per unit volume over your tap room. So you want a bottleneck there. And so put yourself in a good neighborhood where you can rely on traffic. Uh, obviously, if you're not making 15 hazy IPAs and pale ales, you're, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, so my thing would be start small, stay small for, for the time being until the until the landscape changes and stay hyper local, but you have to make good beer fast. So if you have to spend a little bit of money 
maybe uh, buy one or two Edi less Edison lights. You know, when you buy that, I just made a, uh, you buy that. I just started a brewery kit. When you get the Edison lights and you get the, the cement uh, countertop and you get all those chairs that everyone uses and you do all the, uh, the, the slap board that everyone uses, maybe buy one or two less Edison lights and uh, bring a consultant in, you know, to, to show you how to manage your yeast, um, manage your fermentation and package properly. Our, our keg, you know, keg is a package, but, you know, learn the basics. If you don't have it, bring someone in, pay a consultant. It, it won't be that much money considered on the, on the long run. Uh, and then make good beer. You have to make good beer right away now, I think. Um, few exceptions exist. I see a lot of places. I just moved from uh, PA, you know, Pittsburgh. And while we have an amazing concentration of great breweries, there's a pretty big middle area there where some people are making some pretty bad beer and they're still afloat because local has a flavor and people love them because they're a local brewery. But I don't know how those people are making money. I just don't understand it, you know. So Eric Pierce got tons of Concord grapes growing wild around here, so I can't resist. Well, that sounds like a perfect way to use them, Eric. I, I would be tempted if I had... Um, if I still lived in Hawaii and I had those mango trees in my in my yard, I'd be making mango beer, no, no doubt. So, heck yeah, use the uh, Concord grapes. Skins are, are so, what does it say? Tea skins are so tart. Um, yeah, so you'll be picking up a lot of uh, acid from, from the fruit. You know, I'm not sure what the, the grape acid is. I bet there's malic acid in there because that's what's popular in a lot of, um, oh, that's what's prevalent in a lot of grapes. Uh so yeah, you're gonna be bringing over natural organic acids as well as whatever you you pick up from your kettle sour, which is lactic acid primarily. Great ideas, thanks so much. Cool man, let us know how it goes. I think that might be it. Cool guys, stay groovy. Good stuff. Thanks again to my man, Malcolm Fraser. Uh, before we finish up, I want to remind everyone about our awesome sponsor, Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high-quality stainless fittings at great prices and super-fast shipping. Uh, don't forget to check out their BCS 482 control system. It provides everything needed for total brewery automation. Learn more at brewershardware.com. And don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. Well, if you liked what you heard today and you want to be a part of future Q&A live casts, you can very easily do so by pledging a $3 monthly contribution over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By becoming a patron of brewlosophy, not only are you helping us to continue bringing you these shows as well as the stuff you see over at the website, but you get some pretty cool rewards as well. And yes, uh, all past Q&A sessions are available for new patrons to watch. Uh, you can check out all of this stuff over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. We'll be back next week with our second short and shoddy episode. Until then, you can fill your time by reading our experimental articles over at brewlosophy.com. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through no middle man no more.